Most people like to think that they remember exactly where they were on the day that Nelson Mandela passed away. Many of those same people will tell you that he passed away on a certain day during the 1980s, and that he was imprisoned on Robben Island at the time. But they would be dead wrong, as are hundreds of thousands of other people who remember the same sequence of events. The fact is that Nelson Mandela was released from prison Activate. on the 11th of February, 1990, right. having spent 27 years imprisoned on the island. He served as South Africa's president from 1994 to 1999, and he passed away from a respiratory infection at his home in Houghton, Johannesburg, on the 5th of December, 2013. But these people swear that they remembered their version of events correctly and struggle to understand how they could have been so wrong for so many years. This is a phenomenon called the Mandela Effect, where a large group of people, sometimes millions, remember an event or fact differently from the actual reality. And will argue you down. I think that's what I like the most about Mandela Effects. People will argue, you get a good argument back and forth about Whatever it is y'all talking about. Number five. The term Mandela Effect didn't exist at all until 2010, when a paranormal researcher named Sophia Broom began to notice that she erroneously remembered Nelson Mandela passing away, and particularly hearing about his funeral in the 80s, and it soon became apparent that she wasn't alone. She then coined the term that has now become well known to most of us, and as soon as people started to realize that they too had what seemed to be false memories, the floodgates opened on a slew of other misremembered events and facts that seemingly had no explanation. Some examples of the Mandela Effect include the misremembering of product names or logos, such as Jif peanut butter, which many people believe was actually called Jiffy. The most plausible explanation for this is that our brains have combined the names of Jif and Skippy, no. Another popular peanut butter brand. No. By far, the most prominent example of the Mandela Effect comes from a series of children's books that were published between 1962 and 2012. The books would also be converted into a television series that aired between January of 2003. And My childhood had an E in it. Let's talk about it. What did y'all childhood have in it? Y'all were the stains or the steam? Mine had an E in it, bro. I'm telling you. I, you can argue me all you want to, as as my wife would say, go argue with your mama, not me. No, mine had an E in it. Let's, uh uh. Y'all not finna stain me or stain my childhood. And September of 2004. Despite the popularity of both the books and the cartoons, people are surprised to learn that they misremember the title as being Berenstein Bears rather than Berenstein Bears, replacing uh -huh. the A in Berenstein with uh -huh. an E. Mm -mm. There's also the case of the popular breakfast cereal Fruit Loops, which many people could swear was actually spelled Fruit Loops, F-R-U-I-T, but this simply isn't the case. Other examples include the fact that the cartoon monkey, Curious George, never had a tail. Looney Tunes was actually spelled Looney Tunes, as in T-U-N-E-S. The Monopoly Man, whose real name you may be surprised to learn is actually- He had a monocle. <laughs> Don't argue. He had a monocle, bro. Stop it. I feel like they trying to brainwash us and y'all letting them do it. Don't let them brainwash. He had a monocle. Seriously, I'm dead serious. Actually, rich Uncle Pennybags never had a monocle. And he the popular clothing brand, Fruit of the Loom, never had a cornucopia displayed on their logo. What? Despite the proof being plain for everyone to see, Many people refuse to believe that their memory could betray them so badly, and have theorized that there's something more sinister going on when it comes to the Mandela Effect. This has given rise to a number of conspiracy theories in an attempt to explain the strange phenomenon. He don't even look like right without the monocle. That's, that's my support to my claim. <laughs> he don't even look right without the monocle. He had a monocle, bro. I've read them little chants and community chess cards too much to know. I always got to go to jail one. But, and I always thought that was like stereotype for me for some reason. <laughs> I'd be complaining throughout the whole game. But anyway, he had a monocle. 
one of which claims that we do in fact remember these instances correctly, but that they changed at some point due to the existence of one or more parallel universes, or that we're merely a small part of a computer simulation. Although the theory of multiple universes is by no means a new one, it's yet to be proven and currently remains just that, a theory. But it remains a popular one that's been used as an explanation for more than one phenomenon, one of which pertains to the Mandela Effect. It's an area in the cosmic microwave background known as the CMB cold spot, which has not been fully explained by experts who have studied the spot closely. The most likely explanation is that certain hot and cold spots remain in the cosmic microwave background after the Big Bang happened and that we're now able to see those with modern equipment that's used to map our skies. But since this is merely a theory, many people have posited that this cold spot came to be after our universe collided with one parallel to ours, an event that may just be less rare than we think. The theory states that when the two universes collided, it caused a fluctuation in temperature, and for all we know, scientists in the other universe have just observed their first hot or cold spot in their cosmic microwave background. But how does this pertain to the Mandela Effect? It's been suggested that when these collisions occur, the timelines of each of the universes are affected in unusual and unexpected ways. It could be that our timeline became distorted and confused with our neighbors, and that in their timeline, Nelson Mandela really did pass away while he was still in prison. The leak of that information affected some, but not all of the people in our universe. Change so we always hear about our futures being altered if we travel in the past. We've never heard of living in the present and changing our past. That in itself is mind blowing to think about that. Because if you ever thought of something parallel, you never ever thought of it merging and colliding or something or two things that are parallel colliding. You never thought of that. And if you never thought of that, you never thought of what could happen in the event that takes place. So this is an interesting theory to me because I never really took my mind to that place to think about that, but I definitely will now. Leak of that information affected some, but not all of the people in our universe, changing their memory of the event to coincide with the memories of their counterparts. This might seem like an outlandish idea, but the theory gets even stranger when you consider the possibilities that go along with it. Some people believe that their memories weren't merely affected, but that they were all actually swapped with the person from the other universe when the collision occurred. No. Then there's the theory that this wasn't a once-off event, Many people have suggested that our universe is constantly phasing in and out of those parallel to ours, and that these collisions have a serious effect on not only our memories, but actual events. Not only could it be that we correctly remember events from a different timeline, but it's entirely possible that these collisions caused past events in our timeline to be changed. But whether they're aligned with the colliding universe's events or not is still hotly debated and this same debate may be raging on in thousands of other universes at the same time. Another popular theory in a bid to explain the Mandela Effect is that we're living in a computer simulation and that we often find ourselves misremembering events due to an error in the programming code that makes up our universe. This hypothesis has grown in popularity in the last few years, as the phenomenon of a glitch in the matrix has become more prevalent on the internet with videos being uploaded showing strange, inexplicable events, such as people seemingly frozen in time before they suddenly start acting normally again, or planes that seem to be hanging motionlessly in the sky without explanation. Though many people believe that the multiverse theory is nothing more than a desperate plea to prove that we're not alone in our existence, many more believe that it is indeed real and that we feel the effects of these collisions on a nearly daily basis in the form of the Mandela Effect. Number 4. Most of us have a favorite horror movie that we've watched multiple times. These types of films usually have at least a few iconic lines that keep fans quoting them years later. Yep. But they're often shocked to learn that those lines were either misremembered or didn't exist at all. 
But it becomes a little creepier when they discover that thousands of other fans have also been misquoting their favorite characters for years and sometimes decades. How is that even possible? I can quote all my horror movies and not even just horror movies. Like certain movies are, I still use, like if you're, you hang around me, then you'll, you'll become a movie quotable type person because you'll, you'll interject those quotes in moments where you're either, you're either clowning someone or, or y'all going back and forth at each other. You know what I mean? Talking smack to each other. You'll insert a movie quote. We do that all the time around here. So there's no possible way. Like the movie Training Day with Denzel, that's a quotable, like heaven to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I use a bunch of quotables from that movie alone. So if you go back and tell me that those don't work, impossible. I know at that point in time, you just confirmed that there's a parallel universe. That's what I'm saying from, from here on out. When I know substantially that I just know, then to me, all right, now it's, I'm interjecting that our parallel universes just collided. The horror movie Jaws took audiences by surprise when it released in 1975 and it gave rise to a newfound fear of swimming in the ocean, yes, since did. the massive shark in the movie was solely focused on one thing, hunting as many humans as it could. One of the most iconic moments in the movie occurs when the protagonist first spots the shark in the water, and realizing that it would be a formidable task to capture it, says we're gonna need a bigger boat. Or so fans of the movie thought. In reality, the spoken line is you're gonna need a bigger boat. This may not seem like a huge difference, but some movie buffs take their knowledge of their favorite films very seriously, and they're often taken aback by the fact that they missed such an obvious discrepancy. But it isn't just the movie itself that has fans wondering about the Mandela effect, as the poster is also often misremembered. The actual poster depicts the shark swimming upward toward the surface of the ocean, with the woman swimming above, oblivious to the approaching danger. But many people who have seen the poster remember it as having a section in the shape of a shark bite missing, though this simply isn't the case. It may be common for people to forget the exact line. I watched that movie a lot, but I can't remember the, the poster for it or the movie cover. And I'm trying to remember the line of a way where he said either we're going to need a bigger boat or you're going to need a bigger boat. I think he said we're going to need a bigger boat. I can't remember. I was a kid watching that movie. I mean, a kid. Watched it a lot. And it definitely gave me a phobia going in that water. That shark did. But I, I, I'm, that's going to bother me now. Line in a movie. But it isn't often that millions of people get the actual title of a movie wrong. Right. In the case of one of the greatest vampire movies ever made, those who have read the acclaimed Anne Rice novel, Interview with the Vampire, rarely make the common mistake of calling it Interview with a Vampire, as many film fanatics often do. Then there's the strange case of Jigsaw, the villainous antagonist in the popular horror movie franchise Saw, which contains one of the most misremembered lines in any horror movie ever made, since so many people have seen the films. Most people remember Jigsaw's iconic line, Do you want to play a game? which he utters before revealing his next diabolical trap that's been set for one of his victims. But he never said that line in any of the 10 movies that were released in the franchise, as he actually says, I want to play a game. Rather than inviting his victim to their doom, which certainly seems a lot more menacing, he instructs them that they will be playing a game whether they want to or not. It's a discrepancy that many people find hard to come to terms with, as far as movie lines go, that is. Anthony Hopkins and Jodie Foster are both celebrated for the roles that... See, you know what would, would fix all of this? Is if we could go back, but we don't have like hard copies like we used to. Like when I was younger, you go over somebody's house, they have like a entertainment stand or a shelf or something that had all of these movies neat and alphabetized all on this shelf. You know somebody. Everybody knows somebody like that. You know what I mean? Ours wasn't alphabetized, but we had one. You know? And we kept those things for a long time, but now it's like we don't keep that stuff, so it's no way to go back and reference. And it's like they know that, so they're messing with our brains. You know what I mean? <laughs> or this parallel universe theory is, is really true. Because I would definitely go back and look at the saws. 
that they played in the famous horror movie The Silence of the Lambs, in which Hopkins plays a serial killer named Hannibal Lecter, who's finally been caught. Foster plays the part of Clarice Starley, an FBI trainee who is tasked with interviewing Lecter in order to gain insight into a different killer named Buffalo Bill. Hello, Clarice. At one point, Foster's characters enter the room where Lecter's being held at the Baltimore State Hospital, and he greets her with an unnervingly calm expression on his face, saying, Hello, Clarice. This line has been quoted millions of times by fans, who claim that it sends shivers down their spine every time they watch the movie. But in reality, those words are never spoken. Hannibal Lecter stands in the middle of his cell and waits for Clarice to come into view, before he politely says, good morning. Given that this is the first time that the two meet, and Clarice introduces herself directly afterward, it should seem obvious that Hannibal wouldn't know her name yet. But the error has persisted for many years, and likely will for many more to come. Many people regard The Shining as one of the scariest horror movies ever made, given the psychological torment that virtually every lead character goes through before it comes to a chilling end. At one point, Jack Nicholson's character, Jack Torrance, is chasing his wife, Wendy, through the Overlook Hotel, which they've been left to take care of during the harsh winter months. By this point, Jack has all but lost his mind completely, and he's looking to do away with his wife, following the orders of a spirit that haunts the hotel. Wendy manages to lock herself in a room, but Jack decides to break the door down with an axe. Before he does so, he delivers the line, Honey, I'm home. The only problem is that this is also a misremembered line, as he actually says, Wendy, I'm home, leaving even the most dedicated of fans baffled as to how they could have forgotten the actual phrase. The Blair Witch Project terrified audiences when it was first released in 1999 as it purported to show footage that was found after a group of filmmakers went missing in Burkittsville, Maryland. Later, their cameras are found in the woods, and they're found to contain the horrific footage that led to their demise, as the characters are hunted down one by one. When just one character, Heather, remains alive, she looks directly into her camera while apologizing to all of their families, as she feels responsible for them losing their lives. In the process, many people remember her saying the line, I'm so scared, which would make a lot of sense given the situation. But she Wait a minute now, I remember that from the, um, what you call them, like the pre, what, what you call them, when they come out on commercials and you're seeing like the previews for the movie. I remember her saying that in the previews before the movie came out. The trailer... That's what it is. The trailer. I remember that. She did say that. That thing was like the most played at the time. I think that was that thing smashed at the box office. Line, I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Which would make a lot of sense given the situation. But she actually says, I'm so sorry. Which, in all honesty, is also very no. apt. No. It's no. believed that this line is no. misremembered by so many people because no. of a line that she delivers a few moments later, which is, no. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. No. The movie was also- no. she said, I'm so scared. I'm, I'm not gonna allow this to continue to happen. And if our, our worlds did collide, our parallel, we just, we remember, we remember. No, we just gonna fix our minds back to the way they was, put things back in its proper place. She said, I'm so scared. She she said that, bro. I, I That's edged in my brain. Parody in the comedic horror movie, Scary Movie, uh -huh. in which Heather's character looks into the camera saying, uh -huh. I'm so scared right now. Though she also says, I'm so sorry, directly after. Uh -huh. Lastly, a fact about another iconic horror movie franchise that's been watched by millions of people around the world has left fans baffled. Friday the 13th. This series of movies called Friday the 13th has a massive following, and its main character, Jason, is easily one of the most popular Halloween costumes worn every year. But if you've ever dressed up as Jason, complete with chainsaw in hand, you'd be surprised to learn that your outfit was a mistake. Never in any of the 12 movies in the franchise has Jason used a chainsaw to attack his victims, though they have tried to end his reign of horror by wielding the tool, only to fail miserably. Now that I do remember, he always had that darn, what is that hatchet or whatever you call it, machete, whatever it was, he always used that. I've seen him, like, I, I recall vividly him impaling that thing in somebody's head, you know what I mean? And then kicking them off of it. 
and and doing different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't really have no he because he was walking around. Remember, he was walking, and then you run off, and then you think you lost him, and you stop, and you be turning and looking, and then he just peer and peer there and just wham, take you out. Number three. When it comes to song lyrics, it's easy for anyone to get them wrong as many people aren't always paying full attention while listening to the radio or to the music that may be playing in the background. That's true. But when someone is a dedicated fan of a certain band or artist, they usually know most, if not all, of the lyrics. And it comes as a shock when they find out that they've been singing along while completely changing the meaning of their favorite songs by singing the wrong lyrics. Strangely, this happens to millions of people on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And what makes it even weirder is the fact that they all often sing the same wrong lyrics, despite having heard the song hundreds of times before. One example of this is the acclaimed and ridiculously famous song We Are The Champions, which is performed by the rock band Queen. The song has been played during thousands of sporting events, and usually when this is done, everyone who's in attendance sings along since the chorus is so catchy and easy to remember. But the discrepancy comes in during the end of the song, which most people remember as containing the line, we are the champions of the world. Of the world. Unfortunately, many Queen fans are left confused when they learn that the song actually ends one line earlier, with no, Freddie Mercury no. simply singing, no. we are the champions. But in this instance, the discrepancy is much easier to explain than some other examples. Queen performed at a concert in 1987 called Live Aid, which was held in London and Philadelphia at the same time. And all in all, it was attended by over 161,000 people. Footage from the event is still watched repeatedly today, yep. as it's hailed as one of Queen's best live performances ever. And here, the song does indeed end with the line of the world, explaining why so many people confuse it with the studio recorded version. Most of us had a few favorite TV shows when we were growing up, and true fans of these shows did their best to never miss a single episode. This usually meant sitting in front of our TV sets a few minutes before the show started, giving us the opportunity to sing along with the theme song. Yeah, because back then it wasn't no, oh man, I could just play it on demand. I could just do that. No, no. If you missed your show back then, <laughs> or you had to wait to, or hopefully it was one of them shows that came on every day, or if it was one of them shows that came on like once a week, oh, you got to wait all the way to the next episode. But then at the same time, you got to hope at some point in time, they play like a, a replay at some point in time during the week or something like that. <laughs> it was no. And then you had to go find the TV guide. My grandma used to have a TV guide to be able was like this little small square booklet. And you used to have to look through that. She got them like once a month from H her HBO subscription. And you would have to look through there to see what's coming on. Or you would have to get this book, this bigger book that looked like a, a magazine or, or a comic book size. And in there would, would have what was coming on on what channel. And you would have to try to find your show that way. Well, people today are so spoiled. Fans of the Nickelodeon show, Drake and Josh, were no different as they followed along to the sound of Drake Bell himself singing the song, I Found a Way, before the show started. But they were in for a surprise when they learned that they'd been mishearing the song lyrics for 12 years when it was finally performed live. Most fans remember some of the lyrics to the song as it's gonna take some time to realize. But Bell would reveal at a live performance that the line is actually, it's gonna take some time to realign. One example of the Mandela effect in music has taken the internet by storm, resulting in forums, YouTube videos, and TikTok shorts of people insisting that they remember not only the lyrics, but the release date of the Black Eyed Peas song, Boom Boom Pow, but ultimately having to admit that they've been wrong for many years. The general consensus is that the band's female vocalist, Fergie, delivers the iconic line, I'm so 2008, you're so 2000 and late which would make sense, since many people have the distinct memory of the song being released in 2007. But the line that's actually sung is I'm so 3008, you're so 2000 and late, and it was actually released in 2009, causing a lot of confusion among their fans, hmm. one of which stated that they found this fact especially strange, since they worked at a job where this song was played multiple times a day. The only problem with this scenario is that they left the job in 2008, 
a year before the song was even released. Given that many people believe the Mandela Effect to be the result of converging timelines from parallel universes, some people believe that the song was released in 2007, only in another plane of existence. You'd be hard-pressed to find music fans who are more dedicated to their favorite artists than those who listen to heavy metal, with some of the most iconic bands including the likes of Metallica, Black Sabbath, and even more modern bands like Avenged Sevenfold and Slipknot. Many of these older bands were caught in the media spotlight during the 1980s as the satanic panic took hold, in which they were being branded as evil and a terrible influence on the people who listened to their albums. Metallica was no exception, as one of their most famous songs, Fade to Black, from their album Ride the Lightning, was closely scrutinized for its lyrics, which focus on a particularly bleak subject matter. But in modern times, the song is still generating a lot of debate, but this time it's because of the Mandela Effect. The opening line in the song is remembered as being life, it seems to fade away. But fans of the band were taken aback when they learned that the correct line is life, it seems, will fade away. Many fans took to Reddit, explaining that they knew for a fact the first line is indeed correct. But oh. since it's been proven that the latter line is correct, they're left without an explanation other than they must have misheard the lyrics for decades or that it was mysteriously changed at some point during that time. The next example is a song that's sung at every karaoke bar around the world, as it's proven to be a favorite of amateur singers, who enjoy trying their hand at performing in front of an audience. The song in question is the famous I Love Rock and Roll by Joanne Jett and the Blackhearts. The song isn't just a favorite among music lovers, but also fans of the movie Wayne's World 2, in which it makes a brief appearance. When most people sing along to the track, they start with the lyrics, I saw him standing there by the record machine, and in most cases, no one would correct them, since the lyrics are so well known. But in reality, that song starts with the line, I saw him dancing there by the record machine. Now, what y'all have to understand with some of us fans, and I can't speak for everyone, only some of us, myself included, bro, we'll hear a song in the car, around the house, on the radio, on our phones, and we'll listen to it. We'll never read along with the lyrics. We'll just listen to it for years, decades. And yes, we'll hear what we hear, and that'll be the line. <laughs> and then when we finally break down and find out how this, what the song is actually saying, we'll still keep the old line because that's what we've been used to for so long. I'm sorry. That's just how some of us are wired. It sounds better to us that way. You know what I'm saying? Raise your hand if you like that, too. I'm like that. A small difference, to be fair, but one that has gone unnoticed. Even I'm just saying. I'm going to raise my hand again. I'm like that. Among fans of the band for many years. Anyone who has had their heart broken in the past will likely be familiar with the famous Bee Gees song, How Deep Is Your Love? Since it's a love song that pulls at anyone's heartstrings, especially after a breakup. One of the more soulful lines in the song is in the chorus, and it follows the title lyric, quote, How deep is your love? I really need to know. Most of us would have sung along in just that manner while the song was playing in our car radios, but we would have all been very wrong. Some people believe the lyric is actually, I really need to learn, but this is also incorrect, since the correct line is, how deep is your love, I really mean to learn, giving the song a slightly more sincere feel than everyone previously thought. Added to this is the misconception that many fans state the band's name to be the Bee Gees, when in fact it's just Bee Gees. But this can easily be explained since the band's name was originally the Bee Gees, an even shorter version of the Brothers Gip. One last example of the way we're affected by the Mandela effect in music is the song California Dreaming, which was written and performed by the Mamas and the Papas during their heyday in the 1960s. We all know this song, and we've all sung along to its lyrics, stopped into a church I passed along the way, while I got down on my knees and I began to pray. If this is how you remember the iconic song, you may want to revise, since the actual lyric is, while I got down on my knees and I pretend to pray, giving the song a slightly different meaning. Listen, all the Queen fans y'all know, at the end of that song, you say, now I don't know about the studio version, because they can always say that now, but... I've always known that's on the end of the world and it to carry out for a little second before it ends. Yeah, like, nah, not gonna mess me up with that one. Number two. 
It's strange to think that the Mandela Effect could be present in our understanding of historical events. Since we learn about these from a young age at school and they're easily accessible via textbooks and sources on the internet. But the fact is that many people remember certain events differently from the reality. A case in point being the aforementioned passing of Nelson Mandela. But there are many other examples of historic events that are misremembered. Whether it pertains to an image of a historical figure or an act that they carried out at some point during their lives. The first example of this concerns the abduction of the baby of Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator, inventor, and military officer. What? In 1932, the Lindbergh family was thrown into despair as their baby was kidnapped and many people remember the case eventually going cold, with the child never being found. And it's even been suggested that he went on to live a long life, though no one knows where. The reality is far more tragic though, as Bruno Richard Hopman was found to be the culprit and he was eventually executed for his crime. Many people remember following the story as it unfolded in the news, and some even recall watching documentaries that were made about the kidnapping, wow. and they insist that events turned out differently than reality. During the First World War, soldiers would come up with some very inventive ways to either surprise or confuse enemy forces, the most prominent of those being alterations to the camouflage that they wore. But this didn't just pertain to soldiers' uniforms, as the vehicles they were traveling in also needed to blend in with the surroundings. This wasn't easy to do, since massive ships in the middle of the ocean are rather easy to spot, and so a man named Norman Wilkinson invented Dazzle Camouflage. By the time the war was coming to a close, the camouflage was being used on more than 2,000 British ships and it would prove to be so effective against enemy submarines that it was used in World War II on the decks of warships in an effort to confuse enemy planes that passed by overhead. But many people claim that Dazzle Camo was only invented before the Second World War broke out, and they're insistent that it could not have possibly been used during the First War. But the fact remains that it was indeed used during World War I. Mother Teresa will forever be remembered as the face of charity as she focused her efforts on helping those who were in need, including children who had no homes, the promotion of interfaith harmony, and she would eventually be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979 for the work that she had done. She would eventually pass away in 1997 in India, and many people remember that she was declared a saint shortly after, as would be fitting. But once again, this isn't true. Mother Teresa was only declared as a saint by Pope Francis in 2016, a fact that has left wow. many people astonished, possibly because of the long period of time that passed between her passing and her sainthood. King Henry VIII isn't the most likely candidate for the Mandela Effect either, since so much is known about him and the multiple wives that he was married to during his life. But strangely, there's more than one instance where this strange phenomenon has reared its head, and it's left a lot of people confused. The first instance is rather easy to explain, since many people believe that he had eight wives, rather than the actual six. This is most likely due to his title being Henry VIII, which seems to cause confusion in some people's memories. But by far the most prominent example comes from a portrait. Six wives is still a lot, right? <laughs> still a lot. I know somebody, a lot of fellas is thinking right now, yeah, a lot of headaches. Don't say it out loud, sir. Don't say it. Keep it to yourself. Keep your comments to yourself called Allegory of the Tudor Secession, in which he can be seen sitting on his throne while his three children, Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth, can be seen standing on the side. But some people think that there's something missing in the painting when they scrutinize it a little more closely. They swear that they remember the king holding a turkey leg in one of his hands, but this has never been the case, and it isn't known why so many people have made this assumption. It could be the painting's setting that seems social, making it plausible that at least one of the figures might be seen eating something. But it's plain to see that this simply isn't the case, and it's obviously a false memory shared by thousands of people. Uh. Number 1 The Large Hadron Collider has been the subject of many conspiracy theories, mostly because a lot of people fail to understand the work that's being carried out by CERN. Which is to attack. Yeah, I'll call it the Hadron Collider. I call it the black hole creator. That's what I call it. To greater understand the particles that our universe is made up of. When the collider was first switched on in 2008, 
people were surprised to learn that it consisted of 16 miles of superconducting magnets, and that particles were being fired at each other at speeds reaching as high as 99.9% .9 the speed of light. Which a lot of people believe this, this machine, their theory of this machine is that it's aiding or controlling gravity. Is around 186,000 miles per hour. These numbers are hard to get one's head around, which may be the cause for these conspiracy theories to arise. Before the collider was ever switched on, people began to worry that scientists from CERN may inadvertently open a black hole here on Earth, causing the entire planet to be sucked into a void that there's no returning from. Others had more rational fears that the collisions between these particles may cause instability to the system, resulting in explosions, the like of which we've never seen. Then there were those who worried about new particles that may be formed, and the effect that they would have on their surroundings. But none of these horrific events ever came to pass, and the Hadron Collider has been fired up three times to date, the latest being the 5th of July 2022. But the fact that the Collider has been proven to be safe hasn't stopped conspiracy theorists from expressing further concerns, one of which is that the Collider is being used to summon demons from the underworld. This may sound seriously outlandish to most people, but many point to the fact that CERN's logo, which features two circles along with five accompanying lines, could be easily interpreted as the number 666, which is considered by many religious people to be the devil's number. Others note that the superconducting magnets are exactly 16.6 .6 miles long, and again, the recurrence of the number 6 is what caused them concern. They claim that the entire ring is actually a portal, which demons can be summoned through. But what the purpose of this would be is unknown. When the collider was switched on for the third time in 2022, many people, including Cynthia Sue Larson, who coined the phrase the Mandela Effect, stated that they would be paying extra attention to instances of the phenomenon in case they saw a sudden increase. If this was the case, they would take this as solid proof that CERN's operations are responsible for the false memories that are shared by millions of people around the world. When Cynthia was asked whether she had noticed an increase in the phenomenon, she stated that she hadn't, but added that interest in the Mandela effect had seemingly skyrocketed. I didn't never think of that. As many times as I've talked about or we've displayed a video or reacted to a video talking about this thing, I've never thought of it as... Or have I thought of it as some type of mind altering device used to tap into our minds, change our memories, different things like that. Now I'm not going to be able to unsee that or unhear them bring this up to me. Now it's forever planted in my brain about this. I'm going to be super skeptical of it now. This is, of course, to be expected, as many internet users started sharing stories in which the Hadron Collider and the Mandela Effect were referenced as being connected, though no one has stated just how the Collider would have ended up affecting our reality. The same goes for a claim made by a TikToker named CERN Opening Parallel Demet, who's uploaded many videos in which they claim that CERN and the Particle Accelerator are responsible for the changes that are being seen in our global temperature. The user states that this is due to portals that are being opened at the site, though they fail to mention where these portals lead to and how they've managed to affect our planet's climate. Other TikTok accounts do a more detailed opinion on this theory, claiming that these portals open wormholes to distant planets, or that the work being done by CERN has resulted in the existence of mirror universes. To the casual observer, these claims may seem downright silly, but think back to when the LHC was first announced, and you may remember correctly that one of the first people who raised concerns about what may happen when it's fired up was notable theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking. Hawking theorized that the experiments carried out with the Collider may result in the creation of black holes, and that these may pose a serious threat to not only our planet, but our entire universe. Then there's the case of the Strangelets, a theoretical particle or strange matter that has been suggested as existing inside neutron stars. These bits of matter could vary from one quadrillionth of a meter to miles in size, and the concern is that if one of these particles were to be formed by the collider, it could convert all the matter that exists into strange matter thanks to a resulting chain reaction. If this were to happen, according to Eric E. Johnson and Michael Barra, who serve as professors at the University of North Dakota and Boston University Law School respectively, 
the Earth would be compressed into a dense sphere, devoid of life, and measuring just 110 yards across. Most of us are familiar with Neil deGrasse Tyson, an astrophysicist who's known to be outspoken about conspiracy theories, though it should be noted that he often shuts down claims that have no basis in reality. He has stated that the experiments carried out at CERN could potentially result in vacuum bubbles, which would be disastrous for our universe. The theory is that when a high-energy event, such as the high velocities reached inside the collider, take place, a small part of our universe may be pushed into a vacuum, creating a bubble that would expand at the speed of light. This would of course be catastrophic, and although very unlikely, some people believe that some of these events have already taken place, and that they're to blame for so many people experiencing the Mandela Effect on a daily basis. But naturally, not everyone is quick to believe that the Mandela Effect actually exists. One CERN employee has stated that they understand people's concerns, and even why they believe that CERN is responsible for these false memories. But they added that the phenomenon was likely due to something far less sinister, since people tend to remember things the way they want to, rather than the way they actually are. As an example, they cite the Berenstein Bears instance as one where the letters E-I-N are far more common when used in the surname than A-I-N, and hence this is how most people remember the spelling. While many notable scientists have voiced their opinion on the dangers of using the Large Hadron Collider, there are thousands more that are in favor of it, since they have a thorough understanding of what's being done during these experiments, and while there certainly are inherent dangers, the chances of our planet being destroyed or swallowed up into a black hole are all but non-existent. The Mandela Effect is a phenomenon that is that. not going away that. anytime soon. And whether it's caused by collisions between universes, particles colliding against each other, or a type of mass memory slip, remains a mystery that's yet to be unraveled. Thank you guys so much for watching. Listen, man, <laughs> if you've debated with me, if you've debated with me throughout this entire video, man, let me know your responses. Or if you were on my side, let me know which ones you agree with me or disagree with me in the comment section, bro. You know what I mean? We got to figure out what, what's going on. Are they tapping into our minds and changing things? Is there a parallel universe and it's altering things when they collide? What's going on? We're clear, though. We've got past stage one because we all acknowledge something ain't right. All right. Y'all let me know what y'all thought of this video, man. Till next one, I'm gone. Peace.